So we just watched a video on YouTube known as the Yoint video, Y-O-I-N-T. It's a 10 minute long video, if anybody wants to watch that again. Uh, that video was talking about the movement, the action, and the structural components of the TMJ, the temporomandibular joint. We all have a TMJ. It's, uh, we don't all have TMD, the disorder associated with the temporomandibular joint. It's a rather complex joint, and it's rather unique, too, because it's got a hinge movement, and then it has a gliding or plane movement. So the first thing it does is hinge here, where that condylar process, that head of the mandible, articulates into the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. And it has this articular disc that is biconcave in shape. That head of the mandible takes that disc with it as it glides along that inferior surface of the temporal bone. So it's very complex movement, and it's very, very prone to derangement, which was the point of that video. So now I'm going to point out how all of your joint ligaments, and again, a ligament links a bone to another bone, they're all named from the thing to the thing. So one of the reasons this is called a temporomandibular joint is because it's from the temporal region to the mandible. So not surprisingly, you have a ligament called the temporomandibular ligament. You also have down here a stylomandibular ligament. So if you had to make a guess about where that's coming from and where it's going to, what would you say? Stylo Probably the styloid process of that temporal bone down to the mandible. Yep. And that's going to be exactly how it works for every single one of these ligaments. Where does it come from? Where does it go? Your intervertebral discs, they are made of fibrocartilage. Uh, they are, that fibrocartilage is in these circumferential rings. And that outer portion, that is the dense fibro fibrocartilage portion, is known as the annulus fibrosus. And in the middle, you have a more fluid portion known as the nucleus pulposus. Aside from that, your vertebrae have a lot of ligaments that stabilize. Now, if you were going to put a ligament between a spinous process and another spinous process, what might you call that? Interspinous, Interspinous ligament would be a really good op option for that. Um, what if you were on the anterior surface and you were covering that vertebral column longitudinally? Yeah. Anterior longitudinal ligament. There you go. So some joints of the pectoral girdle and upper limb. We'll do a little bit extra focus on that shoulder joint and that hip joint when we get to the lower limb because those are some of the most frequently injured. Your sternoclavicular joint, where do you think that's going to be? Between the sternum and the clavicle. Where do you think your, well, we haven't done acromial and clavicular yet, never mind, we'll do that later. Um, you have something on your scapula known as the acromial process of the scapula, and then you have a clavicle. So acromial clavicular is between that process of your scapula and your clavicle. It goes like this. Uh, glenohumeral will make more sense when you know about the glenoid fossa of the scapula. So sternoclavicular joint, not surprisingly, that has a sternoclavicular ligament associated with it. And also, if it's going from your rib to your clavicle, what would we call that? Costoclavicular ligament. So your glenohumeral joint is your shoulder joint. It would be helpful to know, but we haven't covered this anatomy yet, that this is known as the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity, depending on which source you're looking at, of the scapula. It's this concavity here in which the head of your humerus is going to sit. So when we say glenohumeral, we mean from the glenoid fossa to the head of the humerus. This does have a broad number or a variety of ligaments associated with it. And that AC joint, acromioclavicular joint, is going to be a part of that. In fact, the AC joint is going to be that superior portion of the shoulder girdle. So if it was just this head into this fossa right here, that wouldn't be very stable. So we actually have 
a couple of processes of the scapula that surround it superiorly to the anterior, and then that clavicle is also going to come into play to help stabilize that shoulder joint in the superior direction. So when you're putting your weight through your arms and through your humerus, it doesn't want to dislocate in that superior direction as easily. It's going to be stopped at that AC joint. So if you're going from the acromion to the clavicle, what are you going to call that? Acromial clavicular. Um, if you're going to go from, this is known as the coracoid process of the scapula. If you're going to the coracoid process to the humerus, what are we going to call that? Coracohumeral. And then several glenohumeral ligaments. Again, that glenoid fossa to the humerus, glenohumeral ligaments. You also have coracoclavicular from the coracoid process to the clavicle, coracoacromial from the coracoid process to the acromion process of the scapula. So those are both scapula. It's just bridging across that to add stability. You also have a number of bursae here. You have a muscle overlying the structure known as the deltoid muscle. It actually has three parts, but you're just responsible for knowing deltoid muscle. Delta is a triangle, so it's named by its shape. And that is going to cause a certain amount of friction over this lateral surface of this joint. Therefore, we will have a subdeltoid bursa. We'll have a bursa between the deltoid muscles and this joint surface. Subacromial bursa for when you do put all of that weight through your arms and it's putting pressure in that superior direction. So beneath the acromion, subacromial bursa. And there will be tendinous sheaths associated with this as well. If you remove the head of the humerus, you get this view. <coughs> You're also going to get a labrum in here. So the glenoid labrum is this dense connective tissue portion right here. So you may have heard of people needing their labrum, labrum surgery, labrum was removed, labrum needs to be replaced, labrum injuries. That's your labrum right there. It's connected tissue. And it's surrounding that glenoid cavity that is part of that scapula. So again, this is our most complicated joint. This is as hard as it gets. Your elbow joints, I think this is the old edition and there is actually an error on one of these images that I need to fix, especially if the new edition has fixed this. You have your humerus, you have your radius, and you have your ulna. So you have a hinge joint where your humerus meets both of these and then you're additionally going to have that fibrous connection between the radius and ulna. So that annular ligament is going to help cross over from the radius and the ulna, ulna. You're going to have lateral collateral or radial collateral ligaments, and you're going to have ulnar collateral or medial collateral ligaments, depending on who you talk to. I like radial collateral and ulnar collateral because it tells you a lot. And let's see if we can spot that problem. Yep, I can see that problem right now. Raise your hand when you see the problem with this image. So those tendons are always named from one place to another place. One of these is named from the right place to the wrong place. And it's actually pretty obvious. What's this bone? This is the ulna. What's this labeled as? Radial collateral. So we'll check the new edition. We'll see if it's fixed. Hopefully it is. Nope, it's not fixed in the new edition. Womp womp. All right, you're only going to see the radial collateral ligament on the radial side of the arm, not on the ulnar side of the arm. It should make perfect sense. This doesn't make any sense.
They got it right over here. Here's your ulnar collateral over here, and there's your ulna. Now your carpal bones are mostly square bones, and most of the joints between them are plane joints or gliding <laughs> joints. They glide over each other. It's only because there's eight of them. There are seven pictured in this plane, and I'll tell you why in a bit. There's eight of them total, and it's the sum total of gliding between all of those eight bones together that gets you the motion of your wrist. You have much range of motion throughout your entire wrist. The individual articulations are all plain gliding joints. It's kind of weird to think about, right? You usually kind of want to think of this as more of a hinge joint, but it's not. It's much more complex than that. So I will make the carpal bones part of your um, group activities today. You will, a group will have the carpal bones. And if you're looking for a challenge today, take the carpal bones on and the hand and the wrist and the arm, forearm, depending on how I divvy things up. You'll want more experience with these because there are eight of them. And it's not just knowing the order they're in or proximal or distal row. You're going to need to be able to recognize them from a picture such as this. So I should be able to point at that, and you should be able to tell me that that's capitate. Or I should be able to point at that, and you should be able to tell me it's lunate, even without drawings or without labels. There is a moderately naughty mnemonic device. It's not too bad to remember the order that they're in. Are you guys ready for it? It's not too bad. It's not R-rated. It's PG-13 at worst. <coughs> It's some lovers try positions that they can't handle. <laughs> so it starts proximally and it starts laterally with the scaphoid bone and then the lunate bone. And this is not the orientation this is in. So that makes it a little bit more difficult for you. And I could take this picture and I could turn it upside down if I wanted to. If I wanted to put it back into the correct orientation for some lover's tripositions, I could turn it around for you. I don't remember what I did. <laughs> so I can't tell you off the top of my head what I did. Um, it goes scaphoid, lunate, uh, then tripositions, tricatrum. P is for pisiform. It's not pictured because it's very anterior. It's not visible in this plane. So that little bit right there, that bump that you feel, that's your pisiform. It's a little P-shaped thing. It's shaped like a P. And it's hanging off, off of one of your sides of your triquetrum. Or triquetrum. There's a couple of different ways I've heard it pronounced. I think YouTube pronunciation says triquetrum. And that's fine. So some lovers try positions. And then we go back to lateral that they can't handle. This is the trapezium. Not the trapezius. There's a muscle called trapezius. This is the trapezium. Then the trapezoid. And it's shaped like trapezoid, so that makes it easy. And then capitate. And then hamate. And their hamate looks like a little ham bone. So I'll do more for you than this. Uh, this is all I'm going to do on the recording. Later, I'm going to drop my little diagram that helps me remember what these things look like and how they're positioned. So again, some lovers try positions that they can't handle. Moving right along, lower limb, your hip joint or your coxal joint. <coughs> Whoever gets pelvis today is also going to have a fun time because it's got about three different names. You know it is the pelvis. It's also os coxae or coxal bones. And it's also, weirdly enough, called the innominate bone, which means it doesn't have a name, which is really ironic because it's got three. Um, so your hip joint is also going to be known as your coxal joint or your, uh, let's see, iliofemoral. We've got a variety of names for this. So we've got ligaments that are going to go from different parts of the coxal bone to the, the femur. Now, again, we haven't done the lecture to know the anatomy of the different parts of the hip bone, but the general areas are ilium, uh, pubis, pubic region, and ischium. The ischium's down here, the pubis is right here, and the ilium is up here. So you're going to have iliofemoral, pubofemoral, and ischiofemoral ligaments as a result of that. 
from the ilium to the femur to the ischium to the femur, from the pubis to the femur. And then there's also a ligament of the head of the femur. So if you take that femur bone and you look at the head, there should be a little divot. Even in our plastic models, there will be a little divot. And that's an attachment site for the ligament of the head of the femur. So even though this is a pretty complex joint, I think those naming conventions are pretty intuitive. The only difficult part is when does that pubofemoral ligament start as opposed to the iliofemoral ligament, which is up here. Although the knee joint is a hinge, so it's slightly less uh, delicate, or delicate's not the right word, um, stable, I think is the word that I'm looking for, than the, the hip or the knee, or sorry, the hip or the shoulder. <coughs> it has fewer axis, axes of movement. Nevertheless, it gets injured a lot, partly because it's so low down, partially because we invented football, like idiots, um, and now everybody's knees are injured. And because we have pavement and we run on it like idiots myself included. So you have cartilaginous pads here known as menisci. You have medial and lateral menisci or meniscus singular. You have a patellar ligament because you have a patella bone. Your kneecap is now going to be known as your patella and that ligament that goes over it is the patellar ligament. Just like you do with your radius and ulna, you have a fibular collateral ligament and you would have a tibial collateral ligament. That tibia is medial, that fibula is lateral. So those should be intuitive in their locations. Within the knee, you're also going to have an anterior and posterior cruciate ligament stabilizing. So let me make sure that I say this correctly. That anterior cruciate ligament is anterior here and then it ascends to the posterior and that posterior cruciate ligament is down low on the inferior surface at the posterior and ascends to the anterior. So a really common knee injury here is going to be related to football being tackled from the side is going to put pressure in this direction and it's going to tend to tear things on the medial surface as a result. ACL tears are really common, PCL tears, meniscus tears, especially that medial meniscus, those are all very common. Finally, we're down to the ankle. The deltoid ligaments do actually have uh, other names aside from deltoid ligaments. Again, delta means triangular. This is a medial view. So these deltoid ligaments are on the medial aspect of the ankle. And their mirror image on the lateral surface, those we're generally just going to call the lateral ligaments. And if you're looking for anterior and posterior tibiofibular ligaments, where are you going to look for them? Don't overthink it, it's pretty literal. Yeah, up in the tibia and the fibula, definitely. And probably on the anterior surface and the posterior surface. So there's the anterior tibiofibular and there's the posterior tibiofibular. <coughs> fibular, sorry. Somebody get mad next door? <laughs> Good times, good times. Maybe Rachel's class is mad at me for being loud. All right, that's about it. Um, joints of the foot. Like with your carpal bones, you have tarsal bones that all have very specific names. I think they're a little bit easier than the joints of the wrist, but you, know, you can tell me if you think it's easier or not. The talus is the tarsal bone that participates in that joint between the tibia and fibula, and the rest of the foot. This is the tarsal, or sorry, not tarsal, the talus right here. This articular surface is articulating with the tibia and fibula. 
That articulates on this side with the navicular bone. And the navicular bone, I consider it to be everything's navigating around it. So it's kind of this concave convex thing that is almost like a disc shape that everything else can articulate around. You have a set of three cuneiform bones or cuneiform bones, don't care really how you pronounce it. You have a medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform bone. So those set of three, they've got one name, you just got to put their position back in there. Cuboid bone, he's very big cube, he's off to the side, I think he's kind of easy to spot. And the calcaneus is your heel, but it's a big one. Just you grab your heel in your hand, you're grabbing your calcaneus. Back here you also have a calcaneal tendon, that's your Achilles tendon. It's not on this list, but I think it has probably more clinical significance than many of these on here that I'm having you look at. Now again, I don't really need for you to go home and memorize every single ligament that we just went over. That's not the goal. I want you to see the patterns and I want you to learn the bony features well enough so that when you see those ligaments names, and there's not a lot of them on the exam, but there's a couple, when you see those ligament names or those joint names, you know the bony features so well that they're very, very obvious. That's my idea for how you should do it. You can, you know, do your own thing if you want to learn all of these joints because you're interested in joint anatomy, go for it. Um, generally, I should never be saying, don't memorize that, but I know your time is precious and your time is short, so that is not where I recommend you prioritize. Sound good to everyone? Okay, that's it. We finished the lecture.